Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you my brand new updated roadmap for .NET backend developers for 2023. I did this last year and you really liked it, so this year I updated everything, reorganized it, and I actually streamlined it quite a bit to make it easier to follow and actually used to learn. Now, like with everything in this channel, this will be opinionated, so if you disagree with some of my choices, then please let me know in the comments down below, but these are the things that I would use, so if you follow this channel because you like the way I write code, then this is what I would do. Now, in this video, I'm going to talk you through the roadmap and explain why I chose what I chose in each section, and then give you some ideas on how you can actually learn the thing listed in that roadmap. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe ring the notification bell. And for more training, check out nickchapsus.com. Now, this roadmap actually lives in a GitHub repo, which I have linked below. If you like it, then please give it a start on GitHub. It really means a lot. It helps people find it as well. And actually, I have two versions. One of them is this version, which is a bit of a compact version. It has left and right things. And I also have this version, which is more streamlined. So you only have one column of things and you go all the way down. You're going to find both of them in that GitHub repo. I'm going to use this one for this video because it won't spoil what's coming next. However, this version with both left and right is more compact and might be easier to use for your own purposes. All right, so let's start from the beginning. And the first thing I want to point out is how this is color coded. So the colors of each section doesn't really mean anything. It's just here for flavor. And then the only thing that really means something is the border of each choice. So you can see in the legend here that anything surrounded with green is actually a must know and anything with orange is a good to know. And I will be explaining why something is chosen as good to know as well, because it's not necessarily bad or don't use it. It might be just situational. Your company, for example, is not using GitHub, is using GitLab. That doesn't make GitLab bad. It just means that more people are likely to be using GitHub so you should be learning this as a must know. So we're starting with just general development skills and this is the same as last year. Understand how the web works, HTTP, HTTPS, all that good stuff. And then version control, super important. Git is the one everyone really uses. It has the biggest market share by far and people are using GitHub the most as a way to store the repositories. Now there's other avenues, for example, GitLab is one very popular one and some others, but they're more situational. The one you should know if you are learning how to do those things is GitHub. You should know how to use it. And then of course, Git. Now this is quite different than last year. You should learn how to search for solutions. And you have several ways here. I added two very interesting ones, but first Googling. You should know how to Google for a problem and you should know how to pick the right answer, usually something from Stack Overflow, which is why it is here as well as a must know. But now we also have Bing Search, which is the new ChatGPT based search in Bing and then ChatGPT itself. Both of these things are good to know because they're heading in the right direction. Now, Bing Search will actually give you better results than ChatGPT. ChatGPT can give you wrong results, but learning how to use it is actually good and useful because it will only get better. And I strongly believe it will be solving more and more problems as we go. So keep an eye on that. And then data structures and algorithms. Now that really depends on what type of work you're planning to do. So I'm not going to tell you that it is a must know because I didn't know these things when I started and I turned out fine. I learned them as I eventually needed to use binary search or a tree or heap or something. So you definitely don't need to know them, but eventually you might need to. Then in C Sharp, you must learn at least the basics of C Sharp 11 and understand how .NET and .NET 7 works. Also knowing how to use the CLI, the command line interface is super important. And then I recommend looking into C Sharp 12 and .NET 8. Take a look into the future. That's what really makes a great developer, knowing where we're heading and being ready to adopt those new things as we move forward. Now we have a bunch of standard principles and we have solid, so single responsibility, open close, list of substitution principle, interface segregation, and then dependency invention principle. All of them are very important. I think the list of substitution principle for C Sharp specifically has fallen quite a bit out of favor. The other ones are still very relevant. And then I also wanted to add a few acronyms here. So dry, yagni, and kiss. Don't repeat yourself. You aren't going to need it and keep it simple, stupid. Effectively, some practices that keep you on the right track. And then you should really dive into ASP.NET Core Basics. So Web API, minimal API, please learn that it becomes more and more prevalent as we go. Understand routing, it hasn't changed between all the new ways of doing APIs. Middleware, filters, attributes, configuration, super important. Authentication, authorization, 
and dependency injection. You should definitely know all of these things. Now, in a world that's moving towards cloud native technologies more and more, RDBMSs fall a bit out of favor, but still very relevant. There's no way I would ever choose to have them as a good to know. You must know how they work, in my opinion, because in some capacity, you will use them. Understand RDBMS fundamentals and database design, learn the SQL syntax and all its variations, depending on which database engine you will be using. Now, store procedures, I have it as a good to know, but in my opinion, it shouldn't even be here in the same way that triggers, for example, are not here. You shouldn't really be using them. They lead to bad code and bad practices. I just have it just in case someone says, hey, why don't you have them? I wouldn't use them. I haven't used our procedures in six years, but many people do. So I just left them there anyway. And then in terms of databases, Postgres is probably the most popular. SQL Server is the most popular with c -sharp developers just because of the Microsoft relationship. And then MySQL and MariaDB are very relevant as well. These are the two I would focus on. Some people will tell you SQL Server first. In my opinion, Postgres is a better engine and a more relevant engine. And then we're moving into patterns for building APIs. So REST is still the king of APIs. It's not going anywhere. You should know how to make a REST API with Web API, minimal APIs and fast endpoints, I think is a good approach as well. I talked about fast endpoints in this channel. Definitely check it out. Now, the other two, GraphQL and gRPC, are more situational. They're both excellent in their respective use cases, but they're definitely not as much adopted by especially smaller companies as REST. Bigger companies, they're all using GraphQL. You know, Twitter, Google, Facebook, all of them are using GraphQL. And if you are to use GraphQL, you should definitely be using it with hot chocolate. It's the best library by far. But I understand that GraphQL is a bit more situational in some scenarios than REST, which is just everywhere. Now, in terms of calling your database, ORMs is the way to go. So Dapper is my choice of ORM, my go-to. I write my own SQL. However, EF Core is now so, so fast. I am happy recommending it as a must know as well. So whichever one when I use, it's completely up to you. Both of them are excellent. They have different strengths and weaknesses, but I'm okay recommending both of these approaches for calling a database. Then dependency injection, you should really know how to use the built-in DI functionality. So Microsoft.extensions don't dependency injection. And also I think using Scrutter is good to know. It adds some scanning and decoration capabilities that is lacking from the built-in DI container. So I think it's a good to know. In my opinion, it's a must know, but I'll leave it as a good to know because it's more situational. And then we have some NoSQL databases that I think you should know. Now we have two of them that are cloud proprietary, meaning they only exist in their respective cloud providers. That is AWS DynamoDB and Azure Cosmos DB. You can build a lot of stuff with these NoSQL databases, but you just can't run them on-prem. You have to use a cloud provider but I think you should know one of the two. And in fact, I have a full AWS course, which is free at nickchapsas.com that you can go now and take. It covers tons of topics, including DynamoDB. Then you have Elasticsearch, must know for searching, and then Redis for caching. I've never built a system that doesn't use these two in some capacity, or okay, maybe not Elasticsearch, but definitely Redis, it's just everywhere. And then MongoDB, I would say it's a good to know. I wouldn't really recommend it to anyone, but Many people still use it, so I'm going to leave it here. But I'm more of a cloud first person myself, so these services would replace MongoDB for me. And then in terms of caching, you should know how to use the built-in web API or minimal API output caching, the new one, and then response caching as well. And also, if you need distributed caching, you can use Redis with stackexchange.redis, the library made by Stack Overflow. And then in terms of logging, you have really two choices that are viable. The Microsoft.extensions.logging, the built-in one, and Serilog. Now, I've been historically using Serilog because of the collection of syncs it has and how easy it is to just push your data into different outlets to store them and search them. But the building login has really been updated to have some awesome stuff like source generated logging methods that really eliminate a lot of the performance hits you can take by using login in the first place. So both of them, I think, are a must know. And if the built-in login improves just a little bit more with some extra functionality, it will be my go-to. For now, I'm still using Serilog. Then we have messaging. So Azure Service Bus, AWS, SQS, SNS, both the PubSub version and the queue versions, I highly recommend you know. Again, I'm more of a cloud-first person. That's why those are a must know for me. And then to interact with them, knowing how to use mass transit, in my opinion, must know. You should know how it works, what it does, and why it's so great. And now we go into testing. Now, I'd like to let you know that I have two courses, one on unit testing covering really everything 
and one for integration testing covering everything for that i'm going to have them link in the description down below so if you take those you will know everything you need in these two topics now in terms of frameworks i would highly recommend that you know x unit it's not the only one any unit is very popular as well but x unit is really the go-to nowadays so if you are to know one know x unit if you want to go the extra mile and know both you can use any unit, but really X unit is the more popular one. Now, in terms of mocking frameworks, mock is the more popular one. I personally prefer N substitute more. They both technically do the same thing with different approaches. I prefer the programming model of N substitute, but if you want to use mock, that's absolutely fine. I have both of them as must knows, but really just pick one. And then for sessions, I would highly recommend Fluent sessions. It just makes asserting your outcomes so much simpler. And then in terms of test data generators, Bogus is my go-to because it generates realistic fake data. Auto fixture is great as well, but it's not as good in my opinion as Bogus. Now, in terms of integration testing, you can reuse a lot of the things you learned in unit testing, for example, sessions, uh, or X unit or bogus, you can use all of those things in integration testing, but you must know how to use the web application factory. That's what drives all your integration tests. And you should really also kind of know the abstraction it uses behind the scenes, which is test server. Now, I also think that using respawn is good to know. Respawn is a library that allows you to reset your database to a clean state, and it's really useful for integration testing. And also, I didn't include this here because I do cover it later, but you should also know how to use Docker at this stage to create test containers, and also know how to use the library test containers, which I have covered in the channel and in my course to create Docker containers just for your integration tests, just throw away containers to validate behavior without having to have a database running at all times. Then if you need real-time communication, SignalR is the go-to. That's what Bing Search is actually using. So you know it scales, you know it can do the job. If you need to go one level deeper, then maybe know how WebSockets work, but you don't really need to with SignalR. In terms of API SDK building libraries, so building SDKs to interact with APIs, Rifit is still my go-to, RESHOP is excellent as well, and then Flurlu, I don't know how to pronounce that, is another one I've seen really used. I'm going to leave it here because it has some nice approaches with testing, but really my personal go-to is just Rifit. It does the job, it's the simplest to use, it's excellent. Now, in terms of task scheduling, I recommend using the built-in background service or the inbuilt now periodic timer class that is the fifth or sixth timer class, but it builds on all the best practices that we've learned now in .NET and provides a nice interface to have a repeated task or task scheduling in general. Then if you need something more grandiose with state and everything, then maybe Hangfire is for you. I'd say that's good to know. I don't think it's a must know. Then taking a look at some .NET libraries, Poly for retries and resiliency, excellent. Fluent validation for validating things like your models or some behaviors, again, excellent. Humanizer.core, allowing you to humanize the text in your application, excellent. Benchmark.net, it should probably be a good to know, I'm a bit biased, but I'm using Benchmark.net a lot to detect how something is performing or how it is degradating over time. It's micro benchmarking, so not so important, but in my opinion, you should know how to use it. And then you have things like Mediator, which is good to know. Many people like it, many people hate it. I certainly like it, but using it with caution where I think it belongs. Units.net, excellent for converting units from, let's say, kilometers to miles per hour and so on. And then not the time if you need to use a library that deals with time in a very nice way. Then last but not least, I do think that a good C-sharp developer or any programmer really should have some understanding of how DevOps works and infrastructure as code is a nice way to bridge the gap. So you should know how to script out or code out your infrastructure and both Terraform and Pulumi are excellent approaches. And really that is it. Now, please understand that if something is not in that list, it doesn't mean that you should not learn it. This is just my opinion and I would really like to know what your opinion is in the comments down below. What do you think I missed or what should I add next year and also I don't want you to be intimidated by this because even though it is long it doesn't mean you need to know everything to be a C sharp developer or a dotnet developer you can start as a junior learn some of it and then as you evolve learn more and more and more you don't need to finish everything to be a C sharp or dotnet developer so forget this idea it's an iterative process you have to keep learning all the time and coming back to this but really that is all I have for this video thank you so much for watching Special thanks to my Patreons for making this video possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe, work, and like this, and the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.